over here because you're interested in science communication. I'm a science communicator and scientist myself and I thought I'd give you a little insight on how I started and maybe some inspiration of how you can get involved if this is something you want to do and you just don't know how to get into the community. Don't worry, I have a lot of advice for you. <laughs> So one of the first things I did a few years ago when I was still a university student, I actually worked at the National History Museum in Berlin. I'm a paleontologist, so this was the place to go. I volunteered and was also an intern there. I know that's not possible for everybody. I'm just giving you a little, like, one path of how to do this. That is how I did it. I worked at the museum and in Berlin we have something really cool every year. It's like the long night of science. And then we also have the long night of museums and public institutions like museums, hospitals, they get involved in these events. And very often there are different activities planned in these institutions where you can get involved. For example, when I was still a bachelor student, I had a little booth at the museum that talked about dinosaur teeth. I had all these different dinosaur teeth there and people could come and ask me questions about it. I did that together with my supervisor because I wasn't advanced enough yet in my career to do this myself. But that was my very first time that I dove into science communication and that's when I really discovered that I love it and I want to do more. So here's my first tip of how you can get started. If you don't work at the museum or at a hospital or a university, don't worry. You should always check if there is a science community in your city. For example, in Berlin, and I know that many other countries have these in their cities, we have Pint of Science, Soapbox Science. That's something that I'm also involved in, which was very fun. In 2016, I joined Pint of Science as a visitor for the first time. I wanted to attend because one of my professors gave a talk in a pub about bees. And I thought, that sounds pretty cool. I'm gonna go to that. And it was free of charge. I know some cities charge, but you can find all the information online. I'm gonna link everything below. But I attended and immediately I thought, this is amazing. I want to absolutely do that myself. And I talked to the people that organized the event and asked if I can get involved. And they said yes right away because more hands and more brains are always helpful to organize science events. So that's how I got involved and since 2017 I've been helping to plan events once a year for this Pint of Science festival. And now I'm part of the national team and I run the publicity department. And so I advanced more and more and it's really fun and you get to work together with people who've done this a long time. You can learn together in the group of how to do problem solving. It's a lot of event planning and managing of speakers, managing of, well, locations. So that's something you will always pretty much need to know when you do science communication because it's not just enough to be able to talk about a certain topic, you also have to be really be able to manage everything that goes with it. So make sure that you look up if your city has stuff like that. Pint of Science was a great start for me. Soapbox Science is something I'm extremely passionate about because it's about women in science and you give women in science a platform of um, basically standing on a soapbox and talking about their research to the public and it's a lot of fun and I'm looking forward to our next event. Something else that uh, has popped up in Berlin, I also seen it in Tokyo in Vancouver. It's something called Nerd Night. You might also want to look that up because you can get <laughs> you can get lots of experience there to help out or do one yourself. Which is uh, my second tip. Once you've found that there are these events happening in your city, find out if you can actually take part. Every year there are usually calls for speakers. All of I'm promising that all of these institutions will have social media accounts. So if you like Twitter or you're more on Facebook, Calls for speakers will be advertised there when it's time to recruit people to speak at these events. Check out when they're happening, see if there's a way for you to represent your university, do a talk, speak about your research, and that's something that I've done in the past too and it's been very helpful for me. There are also things called science slams. Science slams have more of an entertaining, like, <laughs> underlying entertainment um, value they want. So you still talk about science, about your research, but 
a sign slam is often like a competition so you have to really you know be snappy be entertaining be funny because people can vote who is the winner in the end if competition is not really your thing and you're more intimidated and maybe you're only starting out i would say something like again nerd night pint of science soapbox science if you identify as a woman that is a great start and maybe a little bit less and uh, a little bit less scary <laughs> Another tip is to use social media. I cannot press this enough. I've, re I've gotten jobs because of Twitter. I've been recruited for uh, science communication events because of Twitter and I'm now a science communicator because I have a presence on Twitter. People noticed me, they reached out to me. So do connect with accounts. Do find people that do maybe something similar to what you do and see how they communicate their science or find people that do something completely different to get a new perspective on what kind of life scientists have in a different field. And it's not just that you have to talk about what your lab work is like. So you can also just share parts of your life because it makes you more human. I believe that the public is very much interested in finding out what scientists are like when they leave the lab. So you can really share your life if you're comfortable with that and if you're not then at least you can share your science and connect with other people. They're really big accounts that you can connect with and very often they do something like Monday Mingle, like use a hashtag or follow Friday and you can find really cool accounts that you can maybe be friends with and that has happened a lot to me recently where I followed someone, they followed me back and we see in our timeline that we like similar things and then you just start chatting and I made so many great friends that I since then met in person. It's a wonderful thing and I think if you're happy and capable to use social media then I would urge anybody to utilize that tool to connect with other scientists. My fourth point connects a little bit to the first one where I talked about that I work at a museum. So if you, uh, well, either you work at a university or maybe you study at university, that doesn't really matter if you're a full-time employee. You can always ask your department if they do outreach or often maybe you probably already know if they do or not and ask if you can, can get involved. If you're still an early career researcher, let's say you do your bachelor's and maybe you don't have your own project yet or your own lab work yet, maybe volunteer and help to support other more senior uh, members of staff representing the university and their, their department maybe. So that's something you can try to do. Even if you don't um, work at university, or a museum, um, you can still always volunteer and reach out to the publicity team and ask them if there's a way for you to get involved. If you're more of a visual person and you're more of a storyteller and you want to share, like let's say your research or life in the lab or in the museum collection, a very good way to do that is either use Instagram, because obviously you can take pictures, that's very visual, or you can use YouTube. That's something I just recently discovered myself and I'm now in a really cool Twitter YouTube community that helps each other out and gives tips and it's super fun and if you want to do educational videos or you want to do like behind the scenes that's something I often do with my science communication project I film behind the scenes videos to show what goes into organizing a SciComm event. How do I find speakers? How do all these things work? And that's kind of like something that I enjoy. And there are lots of people that do very, very interesting videos. How do COVID-19 tests work? How does cancer research work? So many videos that you can watch online and get inspiration and find out if that's something that you wanna do. If you don't have access to joining these science communication events, or festivals maybe you can just you know sit in your bedroom and talk about the research that you do and i promise you there's always something interesting there and people love to learn and i'm pretty sure people will watch your videos so don't be shy if you, you don't need you don't even need expensive equipment there are lots of people that do amazing videos with not a lot of money all you need is a little sunlight and a camera or a phone and you're ready to go what you can also do which is my sixth 
advice now, I think, is start a blog. There are lots of great science writers that started out as bloggers and they get discovered because their blogging is really good and they start writing for either bigger newspaper blogs or um, become science writers. I've seen it amongst friends. They started small because they wanted to share their passion about science and now they're science journalists basically or freelance science bloggers. That's something you can do. Um, not every website costs anything. You don't often have to pay for a domain. I pay for my domain, but if you have a cool name for a website that doesn't bother you that it says WordPress after it or something, let's say francywordpress.com or something like that, then if you just start out and you don't know yet if you want to pursue this, if you want to keep going blogging, then you can start out like that. And if it's something you enjoy and you want to keep doing and you have readers and you have stuff that you want to write about and educate people about, then maybe down the line you can invest in a domain and also use it as a professional CV. I use my blog for writing about women in science, something I'm very passionate about. I share stuff about my own science program. I have a CV section where people can see what kind of stuff I've done. Uh, I even have an award section where uh, I list all the awards I've been uh, or I've received over the years for my academic achievements or like travel grants for university um, representation at conferences things like that and when people google you they'll have all the information that is available about you it's all in one blog and if you then also have a section where you educate people about your research even better and my last tip is really connect with people at conferences I know that doesn't sound like science communication but bigger your network the easier it is to really learn from others connect with others and I'm part of well, I'm part of one committee now uh, at a science society and I learned so much of what goes into organizing a conference which will help you organizing any science communication event and problem solving and working with others how <laughs> how to do online meetings with time zones because often when you have speakers maybe you're not in the same time zone or if you have to interview someone for a blog or a sitcom thing that you want to do you're not often in the same spot so that's something I learned and really you get another another reason to take pictures, blog, film or tweet about the conference. Lots of scientists, including me, have done live tweeting at conferences. Sometimes uh, speakers don't allow to take pictures of their research when it's up at a PowerPoint, which is completely fine and you should always respect that. But a lot of scientists do want it. So I've taken pictures of the speakers or um, written about, oh, the next topic in this panel is this and this and this with this person. And then you can write a little bit about key findings. And not everybody is able to attend these conferences. Uh, they're very expensive, especially if you're a student. And if someone live tweets it, you get a little bit of an insight of what's going on, of what's happening. Even if you're not there, you're like, oh, this person is there. Oh, that sounds interesting. And then uh, you give someone a way to get started by looking up what this person is doing in detail. Maybe look up a paper or you can even link to their paper. It's um, super fun and a good way to use social media. And connect with people, follow each other and see how they're doing it. So yeah, these are a few things that I've done that led me to where I am now. I'm very proud of all my science communication that I do. And now, since last year, the museum offered me my own science communi communication program that I've shown a little bit on, on this channel in the past. I hope you dive into the world of science communication. It's super fun and you don't have to be a professor to do this. You don't have to know everything. If you don't know something, you can look it up. You can talk directly to a researcher or you can just say, this is a topic I'm interested in. Can someone help me out? And this is how you can connect with other people, talk about a certain topic and it's, amazing you'll make so many friends lots of my friends are science communicators or just people i met because they're scientists and i was interested in their work and really science is all about connection and 
who you know and this is a great way to broaden your network to meet people to have fun to educate yourself and others and i hope you'll have a great time if you have uh, if you're involved in a science communication project maybe, maybe even your own please link it below i'd love to check it out and maybe blog about it <laughs> and thank you so much for watching this if you have any questions also leave them below and thank you so much for watching and see you next time mm -hmm.